talk about it from a from the colony perspective and maybe try to look at it a little differently than we've always talked about it. If um, if there's any questions, don't be afraid to just you know shout them out. I'll uh, be happy to take them, and then we'll uh, open up and sort of go around after that. And does that sound good? Sounds good. Great. Sounds great. All right. So um, tonight, I guess I'd like to get into a little bit of understanding the biology of feeding bees, what happens when you feed them, uh, understand uh, the impact of feeding bees, explore um, what you feed your bees, the implications of good nutrition, what makes up good nutrition, and understanding when to feed your colonies. How does nutrition impact your colony health? Um, we know about the three casts of bees in the hive, um, but they're not all equal and they don't all need the, the same food. In fact, um, really what we feed our bees, the, uh, the pollen, the nectar, the sugar syrup, the protein supplement we feed our bees is, is really just the groceries in the, in the hive. And when, when you come home from the grocery store and you bring the groceries into the house and you put them up on the counter, you don't reach into that bag and grab a chicken wing and start gnawing on it right away. You cook it. Well, I hope not, I don't know. I don't want to speak for everybody. But you cook it. And what that does is it prepares the, the proteins to be digested, not just the killing the bacteria, but also it prepares the proteins for being digested. These products that the bees bring into the hive, um, pollen, nectar, um, the protein supplement we put in the hive and the sugar syrup we put in the hive are the groceries. And what happens after that is the nurse bees go after that stuff, consume it, digest it, reconstruct it, and turn it into something called royal jelly or worker jelly. And then feed it to hive. That's what really drives the colony. The, the uh, pre-digestion of this food and then passing it around in the colony. Typically, the, the nurses feed it to the eggs, the larvae, the pupa. And uh, we'll get into that in a second here. So there are really if you think about a colony, we know about the three casts, but there's also three distinct populations of bees in the hive. And those populations are the immatures, the eggs, the larva, the pupa, the hive bees, those bees that are, are uh, in the hive for about four weeks after they emerge as, as adult bees, the nurses, the hive cleaners, the wax builders, honey and pollen processors, and the undertakers and the guards. Those are all the hive bees. And they, they spend four weeks in the hive doing their thing. And then after that, it's the field bees. And those, those three distinct populations have different nutritional needs. And that's what I'd like to talk a little bit about tonight are the nutritional needs of those three different populations. So starting off with the immature population, the eggs, the larva and the, the royal jelly. Um, I like this, this photo. It really shows the eggs in the, in the cell and then the royal jelly. And that's what our larva should look like. And that's the worker jelly and how the workers need to be literally floating in their diet. Um, the brood, uh, the uh, seal bees, uh, you know, the seal pupa, the open, open larva. These are, are bees that are being fed this, this high protein diet for three days after the egg hatches, after three days. They're fed three more days on that worker jelly or royal jelly. And then they get a diet of mixed royal jelly and, and pollen and nectar. And then they finish out their, their larva hood and seal themselves into a cell along with the, the work making the cap and they spin their cocoon become adults after pupation. Here's uh, the nurse bee feeding 
feeding a larva in the upper right hand side. A wax worker in the hive. I like the, that photo. It, it's people don't realize you don't a lot of people don't realize where the wax comes from and how the bees get it. And that's a really cool picture. Um, eventually their guard bees at the entrance. And then they become field bees. So the three populations again, the immatures, the hive bees, and now the field bees, the water gatherers, the propolis gatherers, honey gatherers, and the, and the pollen foragers. These are the other field bees. They have a different nutritional need than do the others in the hive. So let's talk a little bit about how bees eat. Steve McDaniel, a friend of mine in Maryland, took these pictures. And I like I liked these pictures. They, uh, they show how bees eat. If you imagine that one pound pollen patty that you put in the hive, it disappears one lick at a time by thousands of bees. But that's how bees feed. Everything they eat has to be dissolved or turned into a liquid and sucked up through the honey tongue. They don't chew with their mandibles and ingest it into an oral cavity, it gets turned into a slurry and then sucked up that honey tube in the, in the honey tongue and, uh, and taken into the body that way. And that's why particle size is so important in, uh, in protein diets. And that's why you find if you buy the wrong protein diet, you find a lot of stuff on the bottom of the hive because the bees literally can't get it up their tongue. So what do bees eat? Pollen, that's their uh, protein, lipids, minerals, vitamins. And then there's the nectar, which is their carbohydrates, or the nectar or honey, which is their carbohydrates and minerals in honey. And there's a lot of other things in, in the nectar. There's a lot of uh, phytochemicals that the bees need, but that's just the big parts. And then, of course, we feed what else bees eat are the supplements that we give them, all the the hodgepodge of, of stuff that we, we throw in the hive thinking that we're doing some good. Um, honeybee nutrition. Really, what's our goal in, in nutrition? And we, we all have a lot of goals at different times of the year. Uh, these, um, our goal is really to manage population. Uh, a protein supplement is nothing more than a tool to help you manage the population in the hive. So our, our goals are to increase brood, increase longevity of adult field bees, uh, improve health, uh, uh, to work that link between nutrition and disease and reduce the impact of mite parasitism in the hive. There's been a lot of talk about protein supplements, there's been a lot of um, people working on protein supplements. When I was at the lab in Tucson, I had the great privilege to uh, be able to sit in, a, in their library there and they had journals going back to uh, the mid 1800s that monitored beekeeping and articles written and I did some searching and um, found some early articles about feeding bees. And there was a report about a guy named Samuel Hartib in, in 1756 who fed his colonies uh, bean flour added to toast with dark beer and sugar. That sounds like a great breakfast, actually. Um, and then 1825, there was a guy uh, that reported mixing molasses, milk, and egg and feeding to his bees with good effect. 1852, Johannes Mehring. Does anybody know who Johannes Mehring was? Anybody? Johannes Mehring was a friend and uh, of uh, Langstroth and was the guy who developed be, uh, foundation wax. He developed uh, the first foundation wax to put in a hive. But anyway, Mehring fed his bees um, malt factory byproducts and found that it really helped. And in 18, 1878, there was a report of uh, pea flour and beer yeast and sugar being fed to bees. All of those, there's one commonality in all of those, and it's beer. And I think bee, beekeepers and beer have a lot going on there. 
but 18, uh, and in the 1930s, uh, Dr. Hydak started doing some, some research on nutrition and was really the, the modern day, you know, father of, of honeybee nutrition. And he came up with the, the diet of brewer's yeast, uh, uh, soy flour, uh, expeller pressed soy flour, a uh, little bit of uh, uh, milk, uh, powdered milk, and uh, and sugar, of course, to make up the uh, the patties. And he, those were the first patties that he made up. And that's essentially what uh, Man Lake's B, uh, B Pro is today, is, is following Hydax's diet. Jack Thomas told me before he passed away many, many years ago, told me that he had gone to a library in Minnesota and looked up Hydax's work and, and figured out how Hydax did his first diet. So that's what the B Pro diet is. All right. So we know, we know why we feed our bees. It's to ensure colony health, optimize population, um, you know, increase the, uh, build the colonies up and sustain brood during the times of the year when, when uh, there's inclement weather or, or a need to promote the bees. Um, build populations for queen packages. That's why we feed, you know, we feed for mating, mating nukes. We did a study when I was at Wonderful looking at um, mating nukes that were fed small amounts of protein supplement. Um, the queens came, the, the queens that came back um, after mating were much larger, more robust. They had uh, larger thorax just with supplementing the, um, the mating nuke uh, because when that queen emerges, she has to be fed well. And if she does, if the bees don't have enough protein to make enough royal jelly to feed her, she's undersized. She doesn't have good flight and she doesn't have a, a full spermatheca. So feeding protein supplement to a, a queen nuke or during queen breeding, it's a really good thing. Uh, protein is also supplemented in uh, feedlot situations, which we see a lot in California before almond pollination, and then to build um, colonies after pesticide losses. And uh, of course, after parasitism, whether it's mites or nosema or many of the viruses um, really stress the colony and, and feeding can help minimize the stress. And that's all we're really trying to do with feeding is trying to minimize stress. Um, Basically, bees that are three to 12 days old have the highest um, fatty levels and, and highest protein levels in their bodies. Those newly emerged bees, and those, that's the age of the nurses. And those bees are using that, that high protein in their bodies to make the royal jelly to feed. And then after they start depleting their protein levels in their bodies, juvenile hormone levels increase and they become they start moving into the field. If you can maintain protein levels in that first stage, in that three to 12 year, 12 day stage, if you can maintain protein levels in those bees, you keep the, nur the nurse bees in the hive longer and, and you, um, you allow them you know, to do their job. Really colony, colony collapse disorder is nothing more than the nurse bees being forced out of the colony before they're ready and, and having to go feed uh, to forage for pollen because um, CCD was doing nothing more than killing bees, uh, shortening the life of the adult bees, the field bees. The field bees were dying too soon. And really a, a colony is nothing more than a series of overlapping generations. And if you, the field bees are dying off too soon, not living long enough, then the nurse bees then have to go out and forage. But that's like us asking six-year-old children to go out in the field into heavy construction, and they wouldn't last long either. So what's happening is, is if you can maintain protein levels and keep the field bees doing their job longer, 
and keep the nurse bees in the hive doing their job longer, the colony does better. Increased, um, increased longevity equals um, healthier colony. So there's a um, paper that came out. Probably everybody saw this paper. It was about pollen being junk food. That the pollen that the bees are getting today has less protein in it than uh, than it did years ago. There was a um, researcher at the USDA lab in Beltsville that found he uh, wondered what he could do. He was wondering why colonies were having so much trouble. And his thought was, what's going on in the wintertime? Why are so many bees dying off in the winter? And what, uh, what do bees eat as they go into winter? It's goldenrod pollen. So he went to the um, USDA and went to the, oh gosh, um, um, Smithsonian. He went to the Smithsonian and collect and got samples of goldenrod pollen from the archives. They had all these herbarium specimens, took pollen, analyzed it, and found that the protein in 1850 is much higher in goldenrod than, say, it is today. And he found, and his hypothesis was that increasing carbon dioxide levels cause the plants to produce less, um, less protein. So to test this hypothesis, he went in to growth chambers, he set up growth chambers, put goldenrod, grew goldenrod and growth chambers under different carbon dioxide regimes. And sure enough, as CO2 levels increased, protein level decreased. Pretty cool. It's a really cool uh, analysis of the, uh, of the data. And uh, so what we're experiencing today is that our bees are out foraging and bringing back food, but it's not doing them as much good as it, as it did 20, 30 years ago because of our changing environment. When I was at the lab in Tucson, I, uh, I, like I said, I was going through their, their library quite a bit and I ran across this article by Keith Dole. And Keith did a study where he fed um, a colony. He, he, he wondered if supplemental feeding, this is back in 1980 or 1979. So he didn't have the same protein supplements we have today, but he was feeding basically a brewer's yeast and, and uh, soy um, diet to the bees. But he, he wondered if bees fed supplemental diet would make more honey. So he set up five colonies that got supplement uh, as they needed it. Every two weeks he'd go out, or I guess, yeah, I guess every two weeks, or no, every brood cycle, every three weeks, he would go out and take the pollen patty off, weigh it so he knew how much they were eating, measured the brood, measured the pollen in the hive, measured how much honey was in the hive, estimated the workers. And what he found out was that after a, a year, there was really no significant difference in the number of bees that were reared. And there was a significantly higher, uh, higher amount of honey produced. So the, there were no more, not necessarily that many more bees, but there was significantly more honey. And the honey per bee was higher. So the amount of honey that was collected by the individual bee was, was significantly greater than the colonies that weren't supplemented. And the area of pollen wasn't significantly different. So what, is, what does this mean? He, his summation was that, you know, feeding supplement bee, bee, beekeepers could make more honey. And I'm, I read this article and I'm screaming, you missed the point, you missed the point. The, the point is, is that the honey produced by a bee, how did a bee produce more honey? It didn't have bigger buckets to carry it home in. It lived longer. So there was a greater longevity in the, in the bees that were fed the supplement. Therefore, they could fly longer and make more honey. 
So I looked further. I, I wanted to do a trial. And uh, yeah, I'm going to go past that one. Uh, okay, I'll back up. Um, so looking at that, the, the fact that bees live longer, so what do we feed our bees? And all, all bee foods are not equal. There's home brews that everybody has their own little idea on how to make a home brew. And purchase products are all a lot different. So what do you look for in a, in a diet? When I was working on mega bee, I, I looked at particle size, content, what we're feeding the bees, and also um, palatability. Every product was tested, even though there were 10 different uh, brewers yeast out there, I, I tested them all to see which ones the bees preferred the taste of. So palatability and content, I watched out for uh, soy because there were reports that soy um, has um, anti-feeding agents in it called trypsin inhibitors. They're, they try to bake out of it, but it's not all taken out. And that, what that does is it doesn't allow the bees to digest all the protein. A trypsin inhibitor inhibits protein digestion. And there's also stachyose and raffinose, the two uh, diet, uh, the two sugars that bees can't digest and can actually be toxic. And I looked at pH. I wanted to stay on the acidic side of pH. Uh, because bees need an acid gut. In my earlier studies at Michigan State, when I did my PhD, I found that if you acidify a diet you fed to bees going into blueberry pollination, the bees didn't have a problem with European fall brood as, as they were seeing a lot of European fall brood coming out of blueberry pollination. And it was the blueberry pollen was buffering the gut up to neutral. And by acidifying it, we could we could uh, slow down or stop the European fowl brood problem. But anyway, so that's why I, I acidified the diet. And then amino acid ratios, there's 10 essential amino acids um, that bees have to have in their diet and they have to be given in a certain ratio. And if any one of those amino acids is low or is, is low, it becomes the limiting factor then in the, in the diet and doesn't allow the bees to, to digest all of the other proteins. Uh, particle size, I talked about particle size being important. Um, a, a, uh, a photo of, at the same magnification of a bee's gut fed mega bee and one fed pollen. And you can see the, the smaller particle size and all of that does is it allows the bees to digest it faster because as you decrease the particle size, you increase the surface area of the product and they can digest it faster. By taking a 50 micron particle and, and dividing it in half, you don't double the surface area, you qu almost quadruple it. Um, the top two, the blue and the red line on this graph, this is a, a graph of longevity um, and protein. Uh, feeding different diets to the bees, we looked at the protein in their hemolymph and we looked at it over a, a period of time, feeding the bees this diet. This was done in cages and feeding the diet to the bees over time. The top two were, were mega bee, the uh, blue and the red were mega bee. One was a liquid formulation of mega bee, the other was the blue one was a patty formulation of mega bee. The yellow was pollen. And the uh, purple, green, and black were the uh, soy-based diets that are available on the market. The one thing that's, that's kind of obvious is the soy-based diets, the bees didn't live as long as they did on, on the other diets, on the mega bee and the, and the pollen. So we did see something going on there with longevity. And looking at hypopharyngeal gland development in bees over time, fed different diets. This is after 14 days. You can see these are okini, the little individual sacs that make up the hypopharyngeal glands. And when they're white, they're producing royal jelly. And when they're clear, they're producing less royal jelly. The control had uh, nothing but sugar syrup. The soy-based diet 
um, was just that brewer's yeast alone, because there are some beekeepers on, in California that believe that just feeding brewer's yeast is sufficient. And then there's the mega bee. And then after 21 days, the other diets, the control, the soy flour, and the brewer's yeast, you can see we're not producing royal jelly hardly at all. And the mega bee is still pumping out the royal jelly in the diet. So we're, we know we can produce more food longer with the right diet and the right uh, mix of, of amino acids and, and uh, ability to digest it quickly. So again, a colony is a series of overlapping generations. The greater the overlap, the greater the population and the greater the longevity, the more overlap in the generations. So the, the more overlap in the generations means you, um, you've got a bigger colony and that's all we're going for is, is trying to manage our populations. Um, nutritional elements. So carbohydrates, pollen, are all pollens equal? No, all pollens are not equal. Just because your, your bees are bringing in pollen doesn't mean they're bringing in necessarily something that's, that's good for them or can even help them in their imbalance. So um, I get a question quite often, you know, what are the difference between summer bees and, and winter bees? And um, it's, it's just basically a change in nutrition. And what happens in the, in the winter, this time of year, our, our queens are slowing down in their egg production. And what happens is you have a shift in your nurse bee to brood ratio. During the summer, the queen is cranking out 1,000 eggs, 1,200 eggs a day. And that means you've got so many bees emerging every day and are, are hatching every day and, and larva. And the nurse bees have a tough time keeping up with all those larvae to feed. But as the queen slows down her egg production, the number of, of um, nurse bees is, is, the nurse bees are still emerging. They're, because it takes 21 days to go from egg to adult, even though the queen may stop egg production, we still got 21 days of, of bees emerging. And, what happens then is those nurse bees do what nurse bees always do, is eat pollen, produce royal jelly, but there's nobody to feed it to. So they wind up sharing it in the hive. And that sharing, the larva, the, what larvae that are there get really well fed, so they, they put on a lot of fat, but also that royal jelly that's being produced, the nurse bees don't have anybody to give it to. So they internalize some of it and they give some of it away to other worker bees. They share it with other worker bees. And in that sharing, all the bees get more protein, lipids and other things in their body and they put on all this fat and become winter bees. So it's, it's the shift in brood ratio, but it's also the number of, of nurse bees producing this stuff. And that's what you can do by feeding a patty at the right time of year, even in the summer, putting a protein patty in there. You're literally forcing these bees to eat this product and produce more royal jelly than they need. And they wind up sharing in the hive. And remember those three populations of bees that we talked about in the hive, the egg, the egg population, the immature population, the uh, house bee population and the field bee population. When a field bee moves into the field, it stops eating pollen. In fact, they can't even digest the pollen any longer. But nurse bees can, and when they, and the field bees can digest and internalize um, royal jelly or that worker jelly, so they can they can take it and get benefit from it. So what you're doing is you're you're inc increasing protein levels in the hive through this feeding. So I just blew my slide here. I just went through it. But so what we're going for is adult longevity as 
longevity increases, colony population increases. As stress increases, longevity decreases and colony population decreases. And bees with higher protein levels display a greater immune response and have higher vitalogen levels that helps them go through the winter as fat bees. This was um, a simulation done um, on Gloria Hoffman's uh, Varroa pop model, just starting off at 1,500, uh, 15,000 bees in a hive. The, both of these models start off at 15,000. It's just that the one on the model on the left, the bees live four days longer than the model on the right. And over a year's period, the model on the left finishes with about 25,000 bees in the hive and the model on the right finishes around 10,000 models. The difference that four days in the hive, at four days of longevity can make in a hive. If you can increase the longevity of a bee just four days across the, the year, each bee in the hive lives four days longer. Your, popu your po end population in your hive is much higher than it would be if you didn't. So things, what, what causes that stress level that causes the, the decrease in, in longevity, it's uh, viruses, it's varroa mites. They say one varroa mite feeding on a bee decreases its life by a third. Two mites feeding on a bee decreases its life by half. You're, you're losing longevity. So anything you can do to increase longevity helps increase pollen colony population and in colony health. This is that longevity study I was telling you about. These are the cages we used. And the tubes on the side of the cage are the, the protein, protein supplements and then water and, and sugar syrup on top. This was, a, this was kind of a fun study. I wanted to look at Keith Dole's work that he did where he looked at the, the uh, productivity of bees that are fed protein supplement as opposed to those that weren't. So we marked a thousand bees and, and reintroduced those thousand bee, newly emerged bees into a hive. And the first time we did this, my technicians, I had four college students that were working with my technicians. We would put a, um, brush all the bees off a frame of emerging bees and put it in a cage in an incubator. And the next morning we'd have you know, close to a thousand bees for each frame emerge. And then they would have to put a green dot of paint on the back of each bee. They were really excited about this work. They, um, the first time we did it, we introduced the bees, just introduced them back into the hive and, and with a little smoke. And the next morning we came out and all of those marked bees had been killed and thrown out of the hive. The, uh, the bees didn't recognize them. I guess the smell of being away from the hive that long, they, recognize, they didn't recognize them and just threw them all out of the hive and killed them. So we, what we had to do is put them under a pushing cage to reintroduce them for a couple of days, for about a day, I think it was. And then we pulled the pushing cage off and they were integrated fine. And we followed that cohort of bees over time. And so we could watch what would happen as those bees went through that life cycle. So the in vitro study, uh, we fed some bees uh, protein supplement, both mega bee as a liquid and as a patty, and in two different locations, one out in the desert, one in town. Um, and then we uh, looked at the longevity of those marked bees. And so what we found was that after uh, three weeks after putting them in the hive, they were basically there was no significant difference at all because they were still hive bees. There were still bees that were in the hive and they were doing what nurses do and hive bees do and that's eat pollen that, that's in the hive. So their protein levels, there was no significant difference in their protein levels, whether they're fed mega bee liquid or mega bee patty, whether they're in the desert or out in the city. And the controls, they got no feed no supplemental feed, there was no difference at all. 
but take it out a few more weeks. And what you get is the um, controls that weren't getting any supplemental protein. The bees uh, had lower protein levels than the bees that were fed supplements, whether it be site one, which was in the desert or site two, which was in the city. Um, they all benefited from that extra protein and they live longer. And we had to continue, discontinue the study after that because there just wasn't enough, uh, uh, enough control bees to carry on the study after the sixth week. So that's, that shows you what adding protein levels to the hives, just a little extra supplemental protein can do to the, these on the, um, the X or the Y axis over here. These are protein levels in the bees. And you can see that they all had much higher protein levels than those that didn't get fed. So in, in Nosema, the other thing I looked at was Nosema disease. And I was, I was surprised that feeding, I was feeding Nosema spores, Nosema um, Sarani spores to bees. And we were, we were able to lower the mortality levels in the bees. And the only thing I can think of that would cause the mortality levels to decrease when adding protein is that nosema, what it does is it, it's, it's a parasite of the uh, epithelial layer in the, in the gut and the bees can't um, digest anything that's coming through the gut because their, their gut lining is being destroyed by nosema and they can't digest their food. That's why the dysentery look of it. And by feeding extra protein, I thought it would cause more dysentery, but actually the bees live longer. They were able to absorb the protein from the patty as, and, and, uh, and live longer than those that weren't fed it. So in summary, um, colonies grew at a, at a rate when protein levels, and grew at a greater rate when protein levels and supplements are put in the hive. Protein concentrations in fuel workers are higher than in supplement than in non supplemented colonies. Hypophalangeal glands are, are bigger and, and uh, produce longer through supplements. And nutrition can be directly impacted by colony pathogens. I uh, I went to the uh, Albuquerque uh, Balloon Festival one year, and they had these two bee balloons, and the pilots of the balloons were amazing. They uh, they could they, uh, two, the two hands of the bees were Velcroed together and they would go up in the air t at the same time, make the bees appear to kiss, and then they'd separate and fly off. Pretty cool. But I'll, I'll take any questions or let's, let's talk specific about specific questions you might have about nutrition or what I can um, elucidate that wasn't in the talk. Hey, Gordon, uh, this is Phil, um, ex Cal Poly, by the way. Um, and so uh, you talked a lot about the, uh, the additional feed makes a lot more royal jelly. So is this advisable when you're raising queens is to uh, feed them at that point um, so that we end up with plenty of royal jelly uh, to raise queens? In your, and in your cell builders, uh, yeah. in your you, you know, anything, your, your colonies you're going to graft from. I even put it in my colonies I'm going to graft from because I wanted the queen to, you know, to lay a lot on that one frame where I was, when I had her sequestered in that, that cage in that one frame, I wanted her to lay eggs all at the same time so it's easier to graft those, those one and two day old larvae. Um, so I put it in the, the grafting colonies. I put it in my cell builders and finishers. And then in the um, uh, in the mating nukes as well, because like I said, we I worked with Dave Tarpy when I was at Wonderful, and we were sort of trying to resurrect their Florida operation. We were doing our own queens, and we were having a horrible time with the queens. And I sent queens off to Dave Tarpy at North Carolina to take a look at them, and my queens came back, and the grades were you know, really bad C's and D's. 
and it was the thorax size was small, spermatheca wasn't filled very well, uh, total body weight was bad. And as soon as we started putting a little bit of protein in that, in those mating nukes, and the, my crews in the field said, no, there's, there's no problem. We've, we've got a lot of pollen coming in. You don't, you don't need it. But that little bit of extra protein supplement, for some reason, they, uh, they produced more jelly and they must have fed the queens better because as soon as we started doing that, they started come, coming back, you know, A's and A minus, B. Um, the queens came back very much better. The spermatheca was fuller, thorax size was bigger, um, total body weight was greater. Yeah, feed your queens, feed your, your colonies with the queens. So with that also, um, you know, in the spring, we're always trying to grow, you know, get extra comb um, because uh, there's always a shortage of enough drawn comb. And so we're trying to get them to draw comb. Does feeding them encourage that or not for them drawing more comb? You know, I've never done a study on that, but um, I can imagine if you've got more hive bees, you know, staying in the hive longer, you're going to have more wax workers. So yep. I, I, without having, having a study, without having the data, uh, I would say yes, definitely. Hey, Gordon, thanks so much for your talk. It was great. Um, so here in the Bay Area, um, you said you kind of alluded that perhaps you don't need to feed all year round. But what would be the critical months to be putting Paul and Patty on the hive? And would you be putting um, like a winter type, you know, they're now selling like a winter type of protein patty. Um, would you, so, so my, yeah, my question is when do you feed and should you feed something different at those different times? You know, you're, that's a really great question. Um, Different times of the years, the bees need different things, you know, different different feeds. You're, this time of year, we're trying to balance. Going into fall, we try to balance the carbohydrates and the and the protein. When I first came out with Mega Bee, it I, I had a higher protein level than a lot of a lot of other products did, and it started this protein war. If you if you notice pro, protein you know, patty ads now, you know we've got the highest protein level. You know, it, you don't always need a lot of protein. You, you need a balance. Bees, most pollen is between 14 and 18% protein. You don't need 24, 36% protein. Um, about the winter patties, winter patties originally started as Florida patties because the hive beetles, they couldn't put protein patties in the, in the hive without the beetles chewing them up. And you know, you put it in there and half a week later, the patty looks like a dead cat in your hive. You know, it's just crawling. So we, we came up with this Florida patty. Uh, Pete Teal was down there doing research and he wanted a way to feed his bees. So I developed this high, carb, high carbohydrate, low protein patty. And they loved it. And we decided that later when we thought about it and said that would make a great winter patty too. Why, do, why a winter patty? Because um, you don't, your bees don't need a lot of protein in the winter. You need some protein, but not a lot in your patty. You just need carbohydrates. You need the carbs to help keep that, that brood nest warm or the bees warm. So winter patties are usually made with less than 4% protein. That's not enough protein to, to get the bees brooding but it's enough to give them a little bit of protein to help add to that hype, that hemolymph and keep your, your fat in the, in the bees high. And at the same time, give them enough carbohydrates that they can, you know, sustain themselves. I usually don't put winter patties on until I see my bees need it. Um, again, these patties are nothing more than a tool for you to use to manage your, your colonies and your populations. I put the uh, uh, winter patties in uh, when I see my bees up around the top bars and I'm, I know I'm running short on food. Or 
in the springtime, I'll, I'll put a, a patty on like that to sort of kickstart them and, and get them going. I, I look at uh, feeding, I'll start increasing the protein levels about six weeks before um, my first nectar flow. I want to do at least a couple brood cycles before my first nectar flow. And what that does is it, it gets your, your field bees ready because two brood cycles, now you've got extra field bees ready to go out and take advantage of that nectar flow. In New Zealand, uh, the guys put on a lot of uh, protein supplement before they go into Manuka because they don't want the bees using the Manuka honey to, to build the population. So they build the population first and then put their bees in the Manuka and they make all that, that uh, $50 a pound Manuka honey. So when do you feed? You feed when you, it's a it's a tool to manage your population. When you think you your population needs help, um, that's when you you feed the protein and or the the patty, and you you design the protein level to fit the needs of the bees at the time. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Oh, um, hi, I'm Molly, hi. by the way. I'm currently a student at Cal Poly. Um, hey. I'm wondering how you know what the ideal protein levels in the pollen are, because you mentioned that they don't need these insanely high um, protein levels in the pollen patties, but how do you know what the ideal levels are? The ideal levels. Um, I always look at what, what nature has laid out there and, and what I try to keep my protein levels in the spring. Um, and again, if you're putting on a, a protein patty like Mega B or any of these other high protein patties, 24% protein, you need to add carbohydrates in the hive. So you need to put sugar syrup in with it because they can't, protein alone, they can't make brood off of just protein alone. They have to have the car carbs as well. I, um, my, my uh, spring patties, once the nectar starts coming in, I'll put on the higher carbohydrate patties. And then during the summer, I'll, I'll lower the protein level down to 14 to 18%. And, uh, and then for the winter, like I said, it's around 4%. How do you know what you need, when you need it? It depends on what stage your colony is in. Are you in the the growth phase, that exponential growth phase that the colony goes in, in that case, you need as much protein as you can get in there and carbohydrates. When they level off, when the, when the population, that population curve levels off, bring your, bring your protein levels down a little bit and uh, make sure they still have some carbs. And then in the winter, you want a really high carbs and low protein. And that would be something like a winter patty or a candy board I don't know, the candy boards are basically just uh, hard candy with a little, I put a little protein in it. So are you taking Jeremy's class now? Um, no, I hope to get into it soon. I'm just the first year, so I'm trying to get through my prereqs at the moment. All right, good deal. So, Gordy, this, this is actually Sue's lockdown? daughter. Sorry, what was that? Are you on lockdown? Um, I'm currently off campus. Oh, um, you're Okay, yeah, you're doing everything, re everything remotely. Yeah, well, I was on campus and now I'm off campus because they wanted people to leave because the corona levels were getting so high. Oh, man. That's tough. That's tough. I don't, I don't know how Jeremy's doing. I have to call Jeremy and see how he's doing with the class. Well, thanks. Well, good luck and stay safe. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. So this is the one who wants to volunteer to help. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I'll tell Jeremy. Uh, cool. Appreciate that. All right, Jim, you had a question? No, no, I was just saying that that was Sue's daughter. <laughs> oh, okay. So Jeremy, I had a, a, another a question, or Gordon, I'm sorry, um, about, um, so usually when I, I'm not a commercial beekeeper and I'm making patties and I, for some reason, can't get uh, the ratio right where they're not drying up like a brick on top of the frames. Yeah. Um, have you tried using uh, fructose syrup in there, like something like Cairo or something like that? 
No, I've just done sugar water and some oil and the the uh, Ultra B so far. That's what I've used. Okay. Um, the um, you need a humectant in there. You know, it's um, when I first started making Mega B patties, we were using a uh, that blend syrup. It's part high fructose corn syrup and part sucrose syrup. And the thing about fructose is it acts as a humectant. So you can you can put some of that in. You just buy Caro syrup at the at the grocery store and uh, sub, put about a quarter of that as as your sugar syrup. So if you're using uh, four cups of of uh, sugar syrup, you'd put you know one cup of Caro and three cups of sugar syrup, and that'll give you enough fructose in there that should help keep it soft. The other thing to do is go to a bakery supply store and buy um, drivert sugar, D-R-I-V-E-R-T. And that has um, an invert sugar in it that has uh, partial fructose in it. So uh, they use it in, in making cake frostings so they stay soft over a long period of time. Right. So would you would you make the divert sugar syrup the same 50-50? I, I would use the divert as a um, a sugar in my patty. I would I would put um, say um, I make my patties with um, I yeah you you'd use it in the sugar syrup or you could add um, for every uh, pound of mega B powder, every pound of um, protein powder that you're using, you would use maybe a quarter pound of driver sugar in there. And then your heavy syrup to make the patty. And then that syrup, you would use 25% uh, a, a corn syrup to the you could, you could do that or you could if you're using the driver in the in the powder then you may you don't have to use it in the in the syrup you can just use your straight sugar syrup got it but use heavy heavy syrup right okay that's the 50 50 right yeah right no it's uh two to one. Oh. your okay. heavy syrup is two to one light syrup is 50 50. i got it yeah, that's that's one of the first things I did with my class at Cal Poly is we all made patties. You know, all the all the students, one of our first labs was they all got to make protein patties just so they they knew what the consistency was and we talked about what when to make what patty and so we had a patty party. What do you do to lower the pH or is that proprietary? No, no. I just I use um, uh, vitamin C. Either either ascorbic acid or citric acid. In in Mega B, it's it's lowered with citric acid, but you can use ascorbic acid as well. Can you tell how much by taste is enough? Um, yeah, pretty well. What you're doing is you're lowering the pH to um, between 4.0 and 4.2. Mega B comes in right about 4.2 with our um, I can, I can send me an email and I can send you the ratio, but I don't have it off the top of my head. So it tastes, it tastes a little bit tart or very tart? It's a little bit tart, a little bit tart, I'll not puckery, taste. not puckery, but you've got a lot of sugar in there too. So, yep. So it's, it's, uh, uh, I have a question. Um, do you have, um, any experience using glycerin? To keep the patties uh, moist. I've never, I've never tried glycerin. It's a, it's a good idea. I should. Have you done that? Um, not for that. Uh, I've used it to keep um, mite uh, towels, um, uh, uh, oxalic acid moist, but never in a patty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I sent a, I sent a formula out from Lori Miller up in Washington. And to avoid the cement-like texture, she suggested adding equal parts of whichever magic brew you have, magic powder, 
and give equal parts of plain old brewer's yeast that you can order from Man Lake. And that the brewer's yeast keeps it from becoming a cement-like structure. And it tends to work out very well. Also in that, um, in that recipe is a base of 25 pounds of sugar. This is for a five, pound, five gallon um, amount. And then um, oil of, of a choice, and I use olive oil, and then um, uh, half a gallon of uh, apple cider vinegar to set the pH. Okay. So anyway, that that and it tends to work out really well. I've used that for several years, and it's a very nice mixture. And you put that where, Robert? That's that that makes up makes up the no where protein. You, where'd you put it in the chat or online with the ACBA? Oh, uh, last time when we, I sent it to Hal, and I thought we had a kind of a discussion on this. I can send it out again, but it's a. Um, I'd, I'd send it to this this discussion group when we had this kind of discussion before. But I can send it again, but it's a it's just a real nice recipe that I've used for a number of years. But it relies on, you know, one of the magic formulas for half of the dry ingredients. Okay. Uh, Gordon, do you have just a follow up on the uh, glycerin? Um, any reason to believe that that would be harmful to the bees? No. Okay. No. I, I have no data on that. I, I, I know I've known a lot of uh, like you said, the uh, uh, oxalic acid strips. I, I make oxalic acid strips with glycerin and put it in the hives. It works very well. I didn't see any mortality, so. Okay, okay. Gordon, uh, what do you do to try and keep the small hive beetle from uh, eating up the uh, protein supplements? Well, uh, if I've got significant numbers of beetles, I'll put in beetle traps and then I um, I'll put in smaller patties if, if I'm having a problem, or I'll put a shim, what they're called emery shims, uh, just a one in, uh, about a one inch shim on the, on the uh, upper uh, high body, and put my patty in there and allow the bees to protect the top of the patty. They'll the bees will protect the patty and, and I increase my sugar levels so they'll eat them faster, just like those Florida patties and decrease the size of it. So instead of putting a, a one pound patty in, I'll put a half pound patty in. Is it any help perhaps to put uh, your patty on a small circle of like parchment paper or wax paper so that the small hive beetle can't get at it from the bottom? I've, I've, tried, I've tried that. Um, with mixed results. Depends on how strong your colony is. The stronger the colony, the less problem the beetle is. They, they sort of sequester the beetles off to the side. And, the, and I put that shim on so that the beetles can't hide under the, you know, the cover and it's, there's no tight spaces. The bees can protect the patty better and work all sides. Um, but no, I've never tried the, the parchment paper. I tried aluminum foil once, minor success. Gordon, I've got a couple questions. Uh, one is, um, you talk about a mega bee, uh, but uh, have, do you have any uh, input on ultra bee? Is there a difference between the two? And the other question is, um, when you talk about patties and uh, I've seen quite a bit of stuff on the on the internet, so it must be true that people can feed them dry sugar and dry protein powder. Uh, what do you know about that? You mean feed in the hive? Just put dry powder. Yeah, powder. they put dry sugar and they put dry powder, uh, protein powder. I've actually seen a guy actually uh, do uh, what do you call open feeding a dry powder. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's like they would have a hard time eating that if they've got to suck it up through their little proboscis or whatever. So they well, must have to not, bring in their own moisture for that. They're, pack, they're packing it. They're not, they're not uh, sucking it up. Okay. And unless he's feeding it in the hive and in the wintertime, there's enough moisture coming up in the hive that it gets wet. But in California, it's so bloody dry. Um, I, don't, I didn't have luck dry feeding in California. Uh, I had better luck in the south where it's more humid because mega bee is ground so fine, it's, it's smaller than any other particle size of any other product. And so the bees would have trouble packing it on their back legs 
they they dip into it just like I don't know. Have you ever watched bees go into uh, powder or uh, open feeding? No. Go, there's a bunch of them on the, on the internet. Go and look at them. It's really kind of fun to watch them. The bees uh, drop into the powder and get it on their bodies, and they fly back up and pack it with their as they're flying. They hmm. see them moving their legs, packing it, and but mega bee is still fine a powder, and there's not much moisture to it. So they have trouble packing it. And they, um, but in the South, they have better luck with it because it's more moist and the bees can pack it better. But in California, it's so bloody dry, they don't have luck with that. The other thing with open feeding is if you've got 10 colonies, your strongest colonies are gonna get the most and your weakest colonies are gonna get the least. And that's just the opposite of what you want. You want your weakest colonies to get the most and your strongest colonies can do with less. So by putting a patty in there or, or um, making it into a liquid, Mega Bee is the one product that can be made into a liquid feed as well. And that's one way to get around the beetles. I've got a lot of beekeepers that buy it down south, mix it into sugar syrup, and then put it in feeders on top of the hive in, in bucket or jar feeders on top of the hive and the bees can take it and the beetles can't get to it. It stays in suspension? It does. That's why I, in 2002, the American Beekeeping Federation came to me and said, can you make a better feed for us? And can you make one that we can, we can feed as a liquid as well as a patty? And that was one of, that's when we designed Megabee. And we, one of the interesting things about Megabee is we found is that by uh, reducing the particle size, uh, we got it to stay in suspension. We had to reduce the particle size down to between 25 and 35 microns. I imagine it was a trick to keep it from clumping. Yeah. yeah. And it all gets it all gets milled together. The whole product gets milled together, whereas the other products you mentioned, um, I, I think it was Greg who mentioned the um, Ultra B. Ultra B. Right. I came out with Mega B. Man Lake came out with Ultra B six months later. And it's a high protein feed, a lot of the same components that I use, but it's not milled together. And by milling it together, we we break all the all the products down to that particle size, blend it really well. But the one secret that nobody knows is that by milling the brewer's yeast, we're cracking the, the shell, the, the cell of that brewer's yeast and opening up the, the inside, the cytoplasm, to make it more digestible. That's why Mega B is so expensive. It costs me almost as much to mill it as it does for the raw components. Um, one more question on um, the, the um, I guess not the effect of it, but which one do the bees prefer, the liquid as compares to the dry? The, uh, they really don't prefer the dry. Um, you, and like well, I said, down south, you can get them to take the dry. Not, you the patty? Yeah, not to, yeah, your liquid versus your patty. Um, I, I prefer the patty because I can put that patty right over the brood nest. And I know that the bee, the nurse bees are going to get it and, and do their job with it. When I put a jar on the hive, I don't know necessarily where that brood nest is and if they're going to get it at the same rate. Um, there's a little more cleanup with the liquid because you've got to clean the jars out when you're done. But it won't mold. It won't, uh, it won't sour. It won't go bad. We've got enough stabilizers in it that I had a a beaker of it on my on my desk for five years and it never never went off. Gordy, what's the uh, what's the ratio or what? How do you mix the, the liquid? It's uh, the highest level you can put into syrup is about a half a pound of mega B per gallon of heavy syrup, and the heavier the syrup, the better. Anything less than two to one, it'll fall out of suspension. Somebody was asking earlier about it'll stay in suspension. 
It will if you if you mix it with heavy syrup, but it's got to be at least two to one. If it's less than that, it'll fall out of it'll fall out. Say, so Gordon, uh, I yep. if I remember right, I think the guy last week, um, the fellow that Jerry had uh, presenting, mentioned that. I think he said that they actually eat pollen during the winter. Pollen during the winter, and you're saying that they don't eat pollen during the winter. They mostly eat the carbohydrates. There's well, most mostly carbohydrates during the winter because that's the the energy they they use to keep keep the hive warm. Yeah. Well, I so noticed that they'll, they'll eat some <clears throat> they'll eat some pollen. They, you'll see your pollen stores go down, but uh -huh. they have to have the honey to to uh, keep that nest warm. Now I noticed in my, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a very small time operator, but in the, and I, I really haven't started feeding until this year, but this year I, I, I was feeding, you know, I've been feeding uh, since probably maybe a month or so ago, maybe two months ago, and they were taking down the syrup pretty quickly. But, you know, within the past two weeks, they pretty much stopped taking in the syrup. And I don't know what's going on with that one. Uh, but I can see the bees are bringing in tons of pollen. Oh, wow. And they're not taking your syrup. Yeah, they're not taking the syrup, but they're, they're uh, bringing in loads of pollen. Is your hive capped out? I mean, have they... Have they well, I haven't been into it for a couple out? weeks. I haven't been into it for a couple weeks, so I can't really tell you for sure. But, uh, uh, for many of us in the Bay Area, eucalyptus, uh, red gum, blue gum, eucalyptus is a source of pollen and nectar in the winter. That's uh, low protein pollen. I mean, mixed together with other pollens, it, it can be beneficial, but it's, it's a, the gum pollens tend to be a little bit low in protein. But I'm surprised they're not taking the sugar syrup. I'd go in there and take a look. Yeah, both of both of my hives that I are feeding that I'm feeding right now, <clears throat> they were taking it in until just like maybe a couple of weeks ago they stopped taking the sugar. I'm just astounded. That's amazing. Maybe your sugar's gone off. <laughs> no, I <laughs> no, it's still you can tell when sugar's gone off. And yeah. Okay. Get, yeah, mold in there, but uh, no, it's uh well I haven't eaten it, so I can't tell you for sure, but uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's still good. It's been cold. Yeah. If if it's cold, the sugar is not going to go bad as quickly. We do have a minor flow going on as well. We saw last weekend. Oh, is that right? Okay. Well, I'm got, actually, I actually saw drones in one of my hives yesterday or the other day. You got nectar coming in. They'll they'll slow down on the uh, on the syrup too. If you've got nectar coming in, minor flow. Yeah. Maybe that's what it is. I have a question about um, essential oils added to sugar water. Um, is any of that helpful? Like thyme all or? Uh, you know, I, I, did, I did a lot of studies on using essential oils to control mites, um, looking at uh, nosema, and I really haven't finished my work on it, but I, I think there are some essential oils that are beneficial. The other thing about essential oils, they're all, they're good uh, feeding stimulants as well. So you can you know, put essential oils in there to stimulate feeding uh, on the patties or on even on your syrup. And some essential oils will help stabilize the syrup and keep it from going bad as well. You know things like uh, honey be healthy and things like that will stabilize it. I I did a lot of work back in the late 80s when varroa mites first came into the country, uh, trying to use thymol, eucalyptol, camphor, some of these other things to control mites, not as in a syrup, but in a um, um, in a strip, you know, in a sponge form and, and releasing it in the hive. And it does work. It's just a matter of keeping it in there at a good enough concentration to control the mites. As far as feeding it to bees, um, you know, I guess it'd be what you're looking at. What you're are you going after? Nosema? Are you going after mites? Um, I've often said, 
there's three ways to get anything into a hive and, and to uh, you know, control mites or nosema or, or even viruses. You can do it in the vapor phase where you're putting things in vapors like thymol, um, mint oils and that sort of thing. Or you can put it in the hive as a, uh, a contact phase where the bees are rubbing against it like they do with uh, apistan strips or apivar strips or some of these other strips where the bees rub against it and get it on their body, get it on the hair. And then the third way is, is the uh, oral phase where they, they consume it and uh, getting the bees to consume it. And then there's you know some benefits from that. It depends on what you're going after. I've, I've often wondered why we've never developed a, a varroa mite treatment that was systemic, where the systemic phase where you're feeding it to the bees and it goes into the body. And it doesn't take much to change the hemolymph of that bee and change the taste of the, of the fat and the, the hemolymph in that bee's body to eventually cause them to uh, uh, not feed. So like I say, there's, there's a lot of benefits to essential oils. It just depends on what your target is. I have a question. Sure. Uh, my understanding was that since bee bread was a fermented product, I read some years back that adding yogurt to your feed somehow the bees get some benefit from it. I've, you know, I, it's a lactobacillus that does most of the digestion in the, you know, of, of preparing that, acidifying that, uh, that bee bread. That's the one thing that happens when, uh, it's just like making sauerkraut, you know, here, uh, when the bees put the pollen in the, in the cell, they add a little nectar to it and they add lactobacillus from their mouth, uh, from the oral cavity. And that lactobacillus, along with that little bit of nectar that's in there and all the other nutrients in the pollen, the lactobacillus starts producing um, this acid that, that acidifies the, the pollen. And it's basically making silage. Um, whether the yogurt, um, I, I don't, to, to be honest, I don't know your, the answer to your question whether it's, it uh, is necessary. I tried adding lactobacillus to beef food when I was back at Michigan State doing my work with uh, bees and blueberries because I found that I needed to acidify the, um, the diet. And I looked at lac lactic acid and I would buy lactic acid and acidify these bee diets and put it in the hive. The problem was the um, lactic acid uh, was neutralized by, by the brewer's yeast and the uh, soy flour and it, it, the pH would just come back up. Adding an active uh, lactobacillus in there would probably be a good thing. There's um, a couple companies now, Man Lake even sells some and, and there's another company that produces this, uh, um, this mix of, of bacteria that you can put in the hive. And I think as far as yogurt goes, I don't, I don't know that yogurt would necessarily be something I would go with, but I might go with uh, some of these other you know, dried uh, bacteria, try that in the, in the diet. It would definitely acidify it. I, uh, when I was just leaving Tucson, I had just isolated um, bacteria from the mouth parts of bees and was acidifying diets and it seemed to work and the bees liked it and I was able to, to drop the pH of the diet really quickly. Um, but I needed to make the protein patties in two stages. Um, the first stage was I'd make up the sugar syrup, add the lactobacillus or like in your case, the yogurt to the syrup and get it growing and then add the other dry products to it and make the patties up. And I had a better chance of, of keeping the, act, the bacteria 
active as, and, and having it grow. I didn't have as much luck having it grow, adding it at the end. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Sure, you're welcome, Bobby. I have a question. Um, when we were talking about the bees eating the eucalyptus pollen um, right now, so that was a low protein pollen. Are there other benefits to like uh, the pollen that they eat other than protein or is the main one that pollen provides protein for the bees? There's, uh, trying to think of his name right now. It's, it's getting late here. I'm three hours ahead of you guys. Um, there's been a lot of work done in Australia and New Zealand on eucalyptus and gum uh, pollens. Um, are there other benefits? Sure, there are. There's there's other things in the pollens that you know benefit the bees. Um, a lot of enzymes in their pollens. The bees get a lot of enzymes out of the pollens and it helps them uh, digest their food. That's one thing that I put in Mega Bee that that. Uh, uh, I should advertise that more, I guess, but we put it, we have active enzymes in there that help the bees digest, uh, digest the pollens, help uh, break down a lot of the amino, uh, a lot of the proteins that are in there. Um, and they come from uh, a malting process. It's the same thing as you get with uh, pollen. It's the same enzymes that you find in, in malting. So yeah, there are enzymes, there are um, phytosterols and other things in pollen that are beneficial. It's not just the, the different amino acids and the proteins that are in there. Good question. Thank you. So I get to, to go further on that question. That's why the, the mix of pollens in the hive, the not having a monofloral pollen, but having polyfloral pollens is so important because you get mixes of with pollens that have different higher proteins and some that may have lower proteins, but when you mix them all together, you know, you, you have uh, enough proteins that, that are beneficial. And that's, that's what, you know, a lot of these studies on um, uh, pollens uh, adding flowers to orchards and what, what benefit that has. Uh, if you look at Project Apis M's website, there's a lot on um, supplemental feeding of bees with uh, in orchard situations with uh, cover crop plantings uh, to help get away from that monofloral situation. And as soon as you do that, you, you the more mono, the, there's been a lot of studies done showing that the more mon, the more polyfloral the um, the pollens are in the hive, the better the hive does. The better the hive does, but is that better for pollination of the crop for the uh, customer? It depends on, on if, you're, if you're trying to pollinate onions, yeah, the bees will go to anything other than onions. But if you're in <laughs> almonds, for instance, the, uh, the bees, uh, we did several studies on this and uh, there's nothing more attractive than almonds. There've been a lot of people out there trying to put, sell attractants to orchard growers to put attractants on their almond orchards, there's nothing more attractive than an almond flower to a bee. Even when you have mustard growing um, nearby, the bees will work the almond trees. As soon as they've stripped all the pollen out of the almond trees, they'll go over to the mustards and things. And uh, when I was working at Wonderful, I was driving down the road one day and I was going past this beautiful field of mustard and and uh, fiddle neck and other things growing. And I saw this little tractor just going to beat the band back and forth, trying to disc everything under as fast as he could. And I asked the ranch manager, I said, what are you doing? Why are you disking that stuff down? I said, we got all those bees out there. And he says, I want the bees in the trees. I don't want them out in those flowers. And I said, all right, meet me there tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. So he did. And uh, we looked through the orchard and the bees were flying and working the flowers and collecting pollen and, and collecting nectar and working the flower. We walked out in the, in the field where the mustard was, the fiddle neck, hardly any bees. And I said, okay, let's come back at four o'clock. So we went back at four o'clock in the afternoon 
I said, now I dare you to find any pollen on any of these these stamens that have that have uh, dehissed, you know, where you're, you're giving off pollen. And so we walked around and he checked all these flowers and he says, no, they've all been stripped. So I said, okay, now let's go out and look at the field. So the bees, some of the bees were out in the field. There were still bees working the orchard because the bees are still, you know, 60% of your bees coming out of the hive are nectar foragers and only 40% or less are pollen foragers. There are bees still working the flowers for the pollen, for the nectar. Went out in the field, lots of bees on the, on the mustard and the fill neck, other things like that out there. And he said, see, they should be in the, in the orchard, not out here. And I said, do you know what these bees are doing? They're taking pollen back to the hives and that pollen is going to be turned into more baby bees. And the next day, the, each larva produces a pheromone called brood pheromone. And when there's a little bit of brood pheromone in the hive, you know, there's this message to the bees, collect pollen, feed me, feed me. Because the brood pheromone tells the adult bees they need pollen to feed the larva, feed the kids. When there's, you know, that's why if you have a, uh, uh, a queenless colony, you'll get a bunch of pollen, but pretty soon they stop collecting pollen, they just put on a bunch of honey. Um, so in your, I was telling him in the orchard, what happens is your bees are collecting all this pollen on the field. They're bringing it back. They'll turn that pollen into more young, which will then demand more pollen. So the next morning, there's going to be a bigger demand for pollen. You'll be sending more workers out in the field to get protein. So you're actually increasing your, by having more pollen coming into the hive, you're increasing your, your demand for for pollen and you'll send out more pollen foragers the next day because you've got more brood pheromone. The more larva, the more brood pheromone. So that it's like a little shop of horrors, you know, that, that movie. And when the plant was little, it was saying, feed me, feed me. And then when it got big, it was, feed me. And that's what it sounds like to the bees when there's all these larvae saying, feed me. They go out and look for pollen and they, it was interesting. Um, Frank Eichen, who's a researcher out of the Westlaco lab, came up to uh, Bakersfield and was doing research on them. And what, what he found was interesting. He, he wondered if you put bees into an orchard that, you know, was, you know some of the orchards in the Bakersfield area are, are uh, two and three sections large, you know, it's three, four, 600 acres. If you put bees right in the middle of that 600 acres, what is the dance language? What are the, the foragers, what's the dance language of the foragers coming back? So you put up these tents and you put up these observation hives and cameras with timestamps on them. And, and then he was monitoring the dance and then interpreting the dance and, and figuring out on a map where those bees were going. And what was interesting is when the bees are put into an orchard and there's more food than they could ever want right outside the door. You'd think all the, the dances would be just the circle dance, you know, just go outside the door, circle dance. No, most of the dances were uh, a half of a mile to three miles away. The forager, even though they're in the middle of this orchard and they're, they've got more food than they could ever want, they're still looking for food outside those orchards, knowing that this may not last forever. They're, they're looking down the road. And so that was why I was telling the, the almond growers, keep your tractors out of, the, out of the orchards, keep your people out of the orchards. Don't spray during the day so you change the scent of the orchard because the bees will, will say, well, this doesn't smell like what I'm supposed to get, but that one uh, mile away does. And you'll be sending all your bees over to your neighbor's orchard instead of your orchard. And you probably won't even get a Christmas card saying thank you. Hey, Gordon, Gordon, I have a, a question. I know it's late for you out there. You mentioned <laughs> earlier that you did some work in Nepal. Um, were you working with commercial bee workers or just uh, with the honey hunters? I, I didn't get a chance to work with the honey hunters. I worked with honey hunters in Sumatra and that was, that was phenomenal. Um, 
watching these guys climb these 300 foot trees in the middle of the night, just with, you know, uh, rattan ropes and, and uh, uh, smokers made out of, out of uh, bark they had wrapped up. And, but no, in Nepal, I worked with, um, my first project was with native uh, Apis serrana, the small Asian bee trying to, uh, trying to um, help folks raise Asian, Asian uh, small Asian bee. And one of the, the neatest projects I worked with in Nepal was a, uh, an orphanage where the kids were raising, uh, the kids raising bees helped pay for the, the orphanage, helped fund the orphanage. And so they were, we taught the kids how to raise bees and it really was really nice. And they were small hives because the Asian bee is much smaller. It's the size of a nuke. And so the kids could handle them pretty well and they were, their kids were fearless. And we had a lot of fun with that. And then I went back and uh, did a project, uh, basically doing a survey of, for um, USAID and, and uh, the government looking at uh, the potential to expand bee, bee raising in Nepal, looking at possibly uh, expanding uh, Apis mellifera in Nepal. Uh, I didn't really suggest, I, didn't, I thought they should stick with the native bees, but there was a lot of interest in raising uh, European bees over there. And I knew what that would do. It would push the, 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 Europe, the native bees out and they would then have trouble maintaining these European hives with all the varroa and everything else. That was tough. Hmm. Interesting. So yeah, no, the, the work overseas was, was so much fun. It was, every day was an adventure. I had tigers run my project crew off one day and I had elephants come through. I'd planted all these banana plants and elephants come through just pulling up my banana plants and eating them. And <laughs> I was out there yelling at the elephants and my, my crew was grabbing me and saying, don't, don't, they'll, they'll stomp you. <laughs> Uh, development apiculture was all the countries I worked in the, the people were great and and, uh, and it was it was surprising in Indonesia we I ran I did one project in Sulawesi where they uh, we did a follow-up study and showed that people having three beehives in the backyard was equal to having a person an extra person in the family working would generate as much income as another person in the family working. And they, uh, it really raised the income of the, of the families doing that. So it was pretty cool. And we used it also as a, uh, a program to sort of link the people to the forest ecosystem and maintain forest integrity. If they, if they were getting income from the forest and recognize that if they degrade the forest, they won't get that income anymore. Um, they'll help protect the forest. So we did uh, conservation programs with bees as well. Great. Gordy, Richard actually uh, visits Africa on a regular basis to work with beekeepers. Wow, that's great. I, I'll, I'll carry your hive tool for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, we may try to get you. We're doing a work with the Ogiek tribe, which uh, inhabited the Mao forest. Ogiek actually means protector of the forest and it's the main water tower for all of Kenya and they've basically been kicked out by the British government and now by the Kenya government but working with an organization called Smart Village IEEE we're going to try to create a better market for both the Ogieks, the Maasai and another tribe called the Pokot and it's just getting started but we'll see how it goes. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Gordon Townsend was a good friend of mine. He was the, one of the first guys that, that worked in development ap apiculture. And uh, he was out of the University of Guelph, did that back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, yeah, I think he was working in Duduville. Yeah. Randy Oliver's mentioned him a few times. Yeah. Gordon was a, was a good guy. Well, have we exhausted all the questions? 
I'm not I've got one blue sky. I got one blue sky question. <laughs> so the difference between all the different cheeses in the world is just simply the bacteria that it's added to it. Um, so bee bread has bacteria in it. Do mm -hmm. every beehive have the same bacteria or do they potentially have different? Seems to me that some of my hives smell different than other ones. So is there different bacteria strains that follows the queen or the hive or what they're foraging? You know, that's a, a really good question for uh, Kirk Anderson down at the Tucson lab. Uh, there are differences in uh, there are differences in the microflora in the hive. Um, and they've done work by, you know, moving um, frames around, seeing if they can adjust the, uh, the microflora in the hive. You know, I've always been of the opinion that if you, you create the right environment, the right bacteria will come. Um, I think there's, there's, some, you know, there's other stuff we, we still, it's amazing how much we have to learn about this bug and we've been studying it for 2000 years and we, there's still so much to learn. Um, no, I think there are differences in, in bacteria. Uh, Randy Oliver had done some work on this. He thought he had, he'd cracked the, the code. He had uh, come up with this, this bacterial mix. And uh, of course the bees said, you're wrong, Randy. So. <laughs> No, he thought that by uh, switching switching bacteria around, he could he could uh, you know induce different bacteria in the hives. There's something going on bet between the the gut, the oral exchange of bacteria and stuff. We still don't know, but I'm sure there are things going on. And the bees collect. You know, you can have two hives sitting right next to each other. And they'll be bringing in different pollen. And that's why I've always said, if you create the right environment, the right pollen will come because the bees are out there foraging. One assumes, that's like in the cheese. That, one assumes also that when treating hives with chemicals, you're ex, uh, affecting the flora in the hive and in the bee's gut. Right. Not, not to mention what uh, self-medication the bees are doing out in the, in the field that we still don't know about like the guy that observed bees feeding on mushrooms, you know, and, and what that was doing for them. And, uh, you know, bees, bees are known to self-medicate, you know, pick up things that they, they need in their diet or in their, to help with different diseases. So we, we don't know yet. A lot of things that are going on out there. So Gordon, um, do you have any idea, I mean, it seems to me that uh, the bee bread, because it's a mixture of, they've mixed this thing up, that it's going to have some kind of life, shelf life to it, I guess you would call it. But um, any idea how long you can leave bee bread in the hive before you should take it out because it's gone bad? You know, there was, there was one of the students that, that works with uh, Kirk Anderson at, uh, at the Tucson lab. And he looked at bee bread and whether fresh pollen, what's better for the bees? Fresh pollen, pollen that's been stored for a couple of weeks, pollen that's been stored for a month, six months. And basically the answer is fresh pollen is better than, than any other stored pollen. But if they, if they have to have, you know, in, in times of year when there's no other pollen available, stored pollen's good enough. But the nutrition, um, trying to think of the kid's name now. But anyway, he, he found that uh, the um, quality and, and you know, the quality of the pollen dropped off over time. And if it's still in there next spring, get rid of it. Mm. That, and pretty so much it might be better to, instead of feeding them, leaving the old pollen in there, take it out and feed them a pollen sub instead. Yeah. Yeah, if too much old pollen, they're just, you'll, you'll find them pulling out the pellets and find it in the grass next spring. Yeah, I have seen that. Thank you. Sure, I, like I said, I don't have all the answers. It's the nice thing about, about working with bees, they, they make you very humble. <laughs> You 
Anybody else? Uh, you were talking about uh, systemic treatment earlier. Yeah. There is one thing that disrupted, and uh, I have uh, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, about sixteen people here. So I'm probably going to have fifteen and going to be shooting at me through the lithium. Does it? You know, one thing is the if you go to a B meeting, there's twenty five people in the room. You ask a question, there'll be fifty answers. Yeah, so I did, I did try lithium a couple of years ago until, until somebody told me that uh, if you keep on doing it, I'm going to turn you on to the uh, USDA and you will have a big legal problem. Uh, interestingly, that year, I, did, I didn't do one harvest, I didn't do two harvests, I did four harvests in the year. Uh, I had bas basically very low varroa. I stopped it and uh, last year and the year this year I have major problem with varroa using formic acid, using the sponge. Uh, yeah. So the, the lithium but watch out because the, there is somebody that publish a paper out there and the formula that they publish is wrong. It's way, there is way too much uh, drug on the paper. Uh, what I, the dosage of lithium that I had put on mine, when I went to my pharmacist, knowing the yield that I had in honey, and the, uh, the amount of uh, lithium that I had put in there, uh, the pharmacist said, you, you got nothing in there. You might as well go on the beach and lick some sand, you get more lithium. <laughs> Which is so true, this actually. Is, this, is the, this is the lithium chloride? Chloride, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we... Um, I, I saw the paper when it came out with, with lithium chloride. And there were... You know, the, the funny thing was, as soon as that paper came out, you, I, you, all of the um, lithium chloride on eBay was sold out immediately. Everybody bought it. <laughs> Beekeepers were putting it in, they were making up totes, 200 gallons of this stuff at a time to feed to their bees. And it, it did kill mites because it killed all their brood. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, you, you need very, very little. Actually, you, you don't kill them, but you force the, the varroa, you force the bee to, uh, to kick the varroa out. Oh, okay. Because I was finding on the tray underneath, you know, I had the, the the tray, and I found them live on the tray, and I mean, all different size. Yeah, well, the, so, the, the uh, varroa must not like the taste of the bees after the lithium chloride. <laughs> they just jumped off. Yeah. So, I mean, that's my, uh, that's my one penny outside. Oh, he's gone, not too bad. I was going to say, it's not like cheese. Come on, come back on the screen here. Where is he? Oh, he's gone. I will talk to him about cheese. <laughs> <laughs> because you can get one bacteria, but one bacteria exposed to a certain length of time with uh, humidity, temperature, it completely changed uh, the taste of the, the cheese. So that's why back in the old country, you go to one, can one county, they have one cheese that has one flavor, but you go to the county over, same cheese, different flavor. I think it was Randy Oliver when he spoke at, at one of these uh, meetings that he speculated that um, the oxalic acid was interfering with the Varroa's ability to smell the right smell to infest the larva. One wonders, some, something to ponder. Well, it's, I think that's partially what the, um, the thymol eucalyptol camphor mix that that we put in the hives for Varroa does, it, it blocks the host recognition. Um, that's when, you know, working in the vapor phase again. And we, when we talk about, um, yeah, when we talk about the uh, uh, systemic phase, that's, that's something else. Gordon, you mentioned uh, a little while ago about the mushrooms, and I've kind of been interested in that aspect of it. But 
Do you have any um, data to report on that or any more knowledge on that? No. I mean, no it's I been a couple of years since I've seen anything new published on it. Yeah, I, uh, I, can, I can get with, uh, you know, who would be a good presenter on your, your program here would be uh, Brandon Hopkins from Washington State. If you guys can get him to uh, do a program for you, because he's worked with the guy, the mushroom guy from Oregon. Yeah, the problem I have with that is I was uh, pretty heavily involved in mushrooms for quite a few years, and like, <laughs> they become they they not 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 in the way you might think, but <laughs> but uh, when you uh, get involved with mushrooms, they become the center of your the world, and they are the answer to everything, and uh, similar to the way beekeepers think too, right? Yeah. But, so you kind of have to take everything with a grain of salt there. Well, I'm sure there's a number of fungi working in the hives as well. I'm sure yeah. there's a number of fungi that, that work, but you know, the what he had noticed was the bees were self were going out and collecting, you know, water from this one um, elephant ear shaped mushroom and they they thought they were, you know, doing it for a for a particular reason. And so now they're looking at you know, how it affects different uh, viruses and uh, other microflora in the bees. Gordon, you yeah, had- I think, I think Brandon would be, Brandon would be a good guy to, to get on the program. You had uh, mentioned the honey bee healthy added to the syrup. So another question about um, cleaning up the bees guts, when it would be good times to add that to their dietary regime. Same time you you just after you've gotten rid of your uh, your varroa mites in the fall, you do your you take your honey off. You get your uh, uh, starting to get your bees ready for the fall. You do your mite treatment. So after your mite treatment, then you would do your uh, uh, you'd be feeding with protein supplement to raise a couple good rounds of brood after the mites. So you have healthy bees going into order, not bees that have been preyed upon. And you're balancing your population. At the same time, you would put some syrup on with whatever essential oils you want to put in there. Um, so a lot, so I don't tend to, uh, I use oxalic acid shims with glycerin to uh, manage mites. I don't often put formic stuff on there for sure. other harsher chemicals. So is that true with the um, oxalic acid glycerin? You need to correct their guts, having you using that in the hive as a mite treatment. Are you are you mainly talking about like the I mite think, away quick strips and the? I think bar? the ox, I think the oxalic is is a contact, isn't it? That's that's working in the yeah. contact phase. Right. So not they're not really ingesting it. No. It's all I think contact. It's, I think it's more working in the contact. I think they get it on their bodies and that irritates the mites and they fall off. Right. Um, so no, so the, only th the only thing I say about, about formic acid is that um, when we used it in, in Florida on our bees, heat was a problem. You don't, you don't want to put it on when it's too hot. Yeah. But the other thing was the um, what formic does is it kills off the larva in the hive. It's it's really it's really a strong vapor and, and kills the larva, and when you kill off your larva in the hive, suddenly the bees will sometimes reject the queen. They think because brood pheromone was really high, now then it dropped really fast. They think something happened to the queen, and by feeding protein supplement before you do your formic treatments you have better success of, of keeping that queen going because she has a stronger pheromone signature when she's being fed. So you feed her a couple weeks, you feed the bees a couple weeks before the um, formic acid treatment, then you're gonna lose a lot of larva, but your queen has a strong pheromone signature and your bees are less likely to kill her. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So. So just, just watch if you're using anything strong that affects the larva. 
even like that uh, lithium chloride the gentleman mentioned earlier, that kills off larvae. And people were saying, it's killed my queens. No, it didn't kill your queens. It killed the larvae. And the bees killed your queens because they, they thought she had failed because brood pheromone dropped precipitously. And they thought there was something wrong with the queen. When brood pheromone drops, they start trying to uh, supersede the queen. Come on, Sue, you got one more question. I know you do. <laughs> Anybody else? Fire ants. Tell us in, in 25 words or less, fire ants. They're insidious little buggers. Uh, <laughs> when I, How did you get hooked up with that? Um, that was through uh, the Almond Board of California, of all things. They don't, of course, they don't want fire ants in their orchards because they're one of the few industries that takes a perfectly good a uh, tree crop, throws it on the ground, and then feeds it to us. Because um, all the almonds get dried on the ground. So fire ants in the orchard would be a bad thing. And in that, in that same note, the borders are protected against fire ants coming in. So every truck of bees that comes in has to go through an inspection. And they look for fire ants on the truck. And if they find any, the truck has to go back out and, and get cleaned. And so the Almond Board of California wanted me to invent a uh, fire ant trap that they could just slap two or three of these fire ant traps on the hives as the truck is going across the country. And when it gets to the border, the inspector could just lift up the little lid on the trap, take a look. If there's any fire ants stuck in the in the trap, they would say, okay, get processed. But if they, they weren't, he'd wave them on through. So I had to, first of all, find out what attracted fire ants and then how to get them stuck on a board if they're in the truck. We, um, we worked in my, the crew at the lab we worked all summer long testing different um, things, different oils, different, different products, different proteins to see what would attract the ants. Finally figured out a good mix for it. Put it in a, a little, uh, about a four inch square sticky trap, the protein right in the middle. And then the, the ants could go in from the sides and the strangest thing, the ants would, would go in there and they would smell the protein and they would pick up stones and stick it on the sticky stuff and make a road. I have these pictures of these, these sticky boards and they're covered. It looks like cobblestones to get, and they clean out the protein and leave. When I, when I did it in um, isolation where the ants couldn't get little stones, they tried paint chips. They eventually would use their, their comrades' bodies and then get the protein and go, which would have been good, but on, on truck beds, there's plenty of debris and they were just picking up pieces of paint or rocks or whatever, and they would make these little roads and clean out and there would be no, no sign of the ants behind. So it didn't work. Well, actually it did. Uh, if you had painted the uh, protein with a uh, fluorescent dye, the absence of the dye would have been an indicator that fire ants had forged it. Yeah, well. Or, no, I mean, nobody, the, nobody bees, wanted to the bees them. certainly wouldn't have been building those cobblestone roads. I mean, you would know that something was afoot. <laughs> but you don't know if it's another ant, not necessarily fire ant, because some ants are okay to come into California, but other ants aren't. So I don't know if, I, I guess I would have had to test sugar ants, bull ants, about 20 different varieties of ants to make sure they didn't do the same thing. So basically uh, there's no trap, ant, uh, fire ant trap yet? Well, I've got my, I got my notes. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Nope. Nobody's, nobody's invented one. They still um, put a, uh, after I did all this work, the beekeeper said, what's wrong with a, uh, they use those little Vienna sausages and, and they just put one of the ants love those things. So they just put one of those on a, on a nail on the bed of the truck and they, they can test it that way. Gordy, uh, if uh, we wanted to get Megabee, where uh, where would we get it? Megabee.com. Go to the website. You can order on the website or you can contact me, Gordon at Megabee, and uh, I'll, I'll get you whatever you need. I'll, uh, I'll set up with my son. I'll send you a note and there's we'll do a, uh, a discount code for you. Uh, That'd be great. I'll tell my son to use uh, healthy bees as a discount code. We'll set it up tomorrow. Oh, nice. For my next batch, I will mix it with glycerin. Yeah, wrong suggestion. Hey, sounds good. Let me know how it works. We'll see how it works. Yeah, definitely. I need all so, the help I can with formulation. <laughs> you've so given thank you, us, Ron. That was a good idea. You've given us a great presentation today, yes. and I'm not going back to mushrooms. I'm going to work on the mega bee. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, uh, Gordon. And Molly Lee is her name. If you want to talk okay. to Jeremy, I will. I'll write that down. That'd be great. I know that some professors that are doing like field work right now are struggling to get students to volunteer just because of COVID. They don't have as much in-person interaction with their students. Okay. All right, Molly. Good luck. Yeah. I will, uh, I'll talk to Jeremy and to Patrick and we'll get it set up. I think they probably have had, if, if everybody's off campus, there's probably no lab sessions. They're probably just doing the lecture sessions. And if that's the case, um, they, they, they can do more than the 50. They could do a couple hundred if it's a lecture session. It's just a matter of grading the tests. Yeah, okay, I'll check in, I'll look into that. I'll talk to them. I'll Thank give you. them a kick in the butt. <laughs> Thank you. Too bad. Well, thank you very much on behalf of uh, ourselves here and, and uh, the bees for uh, your great presentation. That was a great uh, meeting. I declare yeah, this the official you want, end, you want but I won't shut off. Time. I'll declare this the official end, but I won't shut off the, uh, the Zoom until people want to go thank away. You. Yeah, let me know if you want another presentation sometime. I've got, I can do it. I'm, you name the topic, I can, I can do it, but I've got a pretty good one on pheromones. It's a lot of fun. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you very much, Gordon. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. Guys. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Well, stay safe. I'm going to bed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah.